fall asleep on me. Scott told me I needed to have a visiting preacher on these Sundays when everybody loses an hour of sleep that's louder than I am. And I'm just going to have them turn the mic up a little bit. I may, I may bang on the pulpit a couple of times this morning uh, to make sure you're all awake. If you got your Bibles, uh, turn to the book of Acts 13. Uh, last Sunday morning, uh, we talked about the Scriptures are essential. Uh, the Scriptures are essential. We had a, we're blessed to have a Gideon speaker last Sunday morning. did a great job, and uh, we thank God for that ministry of getting the Word of God out to numerous places. Uh, we support that ministry every year, throughout the year. Uh, this morning, as we continue on with this thought of essentialness, uh, we want to talk about the resurrection is essential. The resurrection is essential. So we're back in Acts 13, and I read the majority of this passage last Sunday, uh, so I'm not going to read it again this morning, all of it. So that's going to give you some homework. I want you to read the entire chapter of the book of Acts, chapter 13, this week. One chapter. It's all the homework I'm giving you. Read the entire chapter this week, and you'll get the full understanding of what's going on here. Uh, throughout the chapter, and we, as we've been covering them. We'll probably be back in here again, because uh, we can't move too fast through it, uh, or else we'll miss some things that God has for us. So if we will, please stand with me. In all the Word of God, we're going to pick up in verse number 30. Acts 13, verse number 30. But God raised him, meaning Jesus, from the dead. And he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our ancestors. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I become your father. As to his raising from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure promises of David. Therefore, he also says in another passage, you will not let your holy one see decay. For David, after serving God's purpose in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and decayed. But the one God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that you cannot be justified from through the law of Moses. So beware, what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away because I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe even if someone were to explain it to you. As they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, Many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would bless your word. We thank you for your word. We ask now, God, that you would put your words in our mouth to give to your people. Hold us up today, Father. You know each one who's here, a beautiful assembly of people that have come to worship you. And God, may you be glorified and lifted up. If anybody is here lost today, God, may you speak to them and draw them to salvation. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we give you the greatest praise and thanksgiving that we can. In Christ's name, and amen. You may be seeing, may God bless his word this morning. The resurrection is essential. The scriptures tell us in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, the scriptures tell us about uh, King Saul, Reigning over it, Paul points him out in this sermon that Paul uh, spoke about uh, there in the synagogue in Antioch. He talks about David becoming king after Saul, and how David was the man after God's own heart, how David would have a descendant, though, who would be the Messiah, who would come and reign as king forever upon David's throne, which means it's in Jerusalem. And Jesus will do that at some point in time in the future. But after Paul is given permission... To speak in the synagogue, uh, Paul goes over this entire uh, sermon about the history of the covenant of God with Israel until he brings down to David and then points out Jesus in this passage. We find 
he's speaking to a predominantly Jewish audience. And so he can speak to them of the law and of the prophets, and they would know what he's talking about. Because in the synagogue meeting, every, every Sabbath, part of the Old Testament prophecies would be read, the law would be read, and, and then someone would speak. And Paul was given permission to speak that day. And he spoke. Anytime we find Paul from here, from the time he was converted to the end of his life in the book of Acts, we find when he is given an opportunity to speak, no matter what it is, he's always going to bring up Jesus. In your daily conversations, I ask you, when's the last time in your daily conversation with somebody, whether it be at work, school, or wherever it might be, in your friendships, your family members, that you bring up Jesus in the conversation? When's the last time? Is he a part of your daily conversation? Well, part of the reason why he should be daily a part of our conversation with other people is because he's the Son of God, we know. He's the Savior of the world, we know. But he's the only one to have ever conquered death. He conquered death. He died on the cross and three days later rose again. Well, Paul, what about Lazarus? Lazarus didn't conquer death. The young man who had... Uh, the young widow woman whose son was dead, who they were carried out to bury, he didn't conquer death. Jesus raised him from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus is the one who conquered death, not those two guys. No one can conquer death on their own. Only Jesus can, and he did. After Paul zeroes in, I wrote that word in my notes, zeroed in, he focused when he focused in on Jesus being the Messiah, his death and Paul's main point of this sermon was the resurrection. That's what he focused on. The death, the crucifixion, death and resurrection of Jesus. Because the resurrection is essential. The resurrection, first off and foremost, it fulfills Scripture. We find in Isaiah 53, and I alluded to it last Sunday and called it, and I said it was in Psalms, and I was totally uh, out of my sort in that, that, that point in time, but in Isaiah 53, we talked about the suffering servant. And I would like to give you extra homework. So this, will, this won't be your homework. This will be extra credit, okay? Go read Isaiah chapter 53. It points out, it is clearly directed at us who, is the, who Isaiah is speaking about in that passage. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who suffered for us. God had declared and declared that the Messiah would suffer. If you remember, I know we're getting close to Easter, and we're getting close to Resurrection Sunday. I know it's in, 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 in the near future. I know it's coming. And we'll celebrate it. We are. We can celebrate the resurrection, though, every Sunday. And we should every Sunday that we gather to worship, we should celebrate the resurrection. But on the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, as Jesus appears to them and begins to speak to them, he points out to them how the Messiah was going to suffer and die. And they didn't understand it until he opened their eyes. Well, today we're asking for God to open our understanding of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was sent to die for our sins, to pay the price for my sins and yours and rise again from the dead. God had also declared that the Messiah would rise from the dead. We're seeing this decay mentioned here, and the CSB, the HCSB, and some other translations use that word decay, uh, did not suffer in the ground. David was buried. When David died as king of Israel, he would have been wrapped, anointing oil put on him, fragrant since put on him, and he was buried in a tomb where his body decayed. Jesus we, know, Jesus, we know when he died on the cross, we find he was taken down. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus later uh, took his body, wrapped it in a cloth, put spices on it, and placed him in Joseph's own tomb and rolled a stone against the door. Three days later on, this, on, on Sunday morning, Mary Magdalene and some other women went on their way to the tomb because they didn't trust Nicodemus and Joseph to have taken care of the body of Jesus properly and were going to anoint his body even more. The fragrances would keep down the smell of decay, of death. But when they got to the tomb, the stone was rolled away from the door and Jesus wasn't there. 
The angels had rolled the stone away so people could see that he had risen from the dead. He did not decay in the ground. That's what we're speaking about here, what Paul is talking about of quoting these Old Testament prophecies. You will not suffer decay. No other Israelite, no other Israelite rose from the dead and escaped the decay of the body in the tomb. No one except Jesus. He's the only one. For Lazarus, even though Jesus raised him the dead after he was put in the tomb, remember when Jesus told him, roll the stone away, what did Martha say? He's going to stink. He stinks. Why? Because we know what happens. Back in February, if you didn't know it was skunk mating season in East Tennessee, then I don't know what you were driving. You weren't driving around here at all. There were skunks everywhere on 11W25E, 11E. Anywhere you went, there were dead skunks. And if you hit one, you knew about it when you got home. Just part of it. We know what happens when the body decays. It stinks. Not so with Jesus. He did not suffer decay. The resurrection fulfilled Scripture. For Jesus did not just come to die and pay for our sins. He came to conquer death. He came to conquer the grave. You see, all the Old Testament sacrifices, all the lambs, all the sheep, all the goats, the birds, all those things, they died and never lived again. Jesus is the only sacrifice to have died and risen from the dead. We find the resurrection fulfills Scripture. Secondly, the resurrection sets apart, sets Jesus apart. It sets Jesus apart. The resurrection is essential because it sets Jesus apart. It sets him apart. He's different. He's above everything else. Yes, he's creator. Yes, he's God. Yes, he's the Savior. Yes, he's king. Yes, he's Lord. Yes, he is these things. He is set apart. Jesus is God, but he is also the son of David. How can this be? How could Jesus have two fathers? If you want to get technical, he had three. He had God as his father. Ultimately, it's who he is. He had Joseph as being his earthly father who had nothing to do with his birth other than helping Mary give birth to him. But he was a descendant of David. So he can even trace back that as being his father here on this earth. Jesus is the son of God, but also a son of David, a descendant of David, rightful heir to the kingship of Judah and Israel. When David David was given the prophecy that he would have a son who would always sit on the throne, David couldn't understand that. There's no way it could have been Solomon, no way it could have been any of Solomon's sons, or any of their sons, was it Hezekiah or Josiah or Zedekiah, who was the last king of Judah? It was not any of those. There's no way it could have been any of them because they all died. David, when he was given that prophecy, he told God, how can this be? You have told your servant of things that will happen in the future. You've told him of things that are far beyond my understanding. How can this be? David never could understand it. But I can tell you today, David understands it now. Because he's with not just a descendant, he's with his king. For Jesus is David's king. Jesus is David's Lord. Jesus is the one David worships today, not himself. David may lead the singing in heaven, for David was a great singer. And I look forward to hearing David sing someday. Praise to the king. Jesus is God. We have to always, never, ever, ever lose sight of that. Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies of the Messiah. All of them. All the ones spoken about, they would come. They would deliver. They would save. They would rescue. But also that he would suffer and die and rise from the dead. Jesus fulfilled all of those. Even the obscure ones. We find where he would go into the places of darkness. Yeah, he went to Galilee. He went to Samaria where the Jews at that day and time thought there's spiritual darkness in those areas. 
Where did Jesus go? He went where there was spiritual darkness. Why? To shine the light of salvation on those who needed to be saved. When you were lost, when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, you were in spiritual darkness. But Jesus Christ came and shined the light of his love upon you and drew you out of there. Because of the resurrection, he can do this. For if Jesus only died and did not rise from the dead, then we would be just like every other religion. Every other religion. That has some great person, quasi-great person, great teacher, great whatever, who has died is a martyr now. No, not so with us. Our Savior is alive. He's living, and he's going to come back again someday. Paul says, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, by raising up Jesus as it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have become your father. We mentioned in Sunday school this morning when Jesus was baptized, baptized, and his father told him, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. I mean, when on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, Peter, James, and John are up there with Jesus, and there they beheld uh, Moses and Elijah speaking with Jesus. And when that's all taken place, after seeing Jesus in his glorified state, Peter says, let's stay here. Let's stay on this mountain. Let's build a tabernacle for Moses and one for Elijah and one for you. God stepped down. And I'm going to paraphrase what God says. You don't need to build a tabernacle for Moses and Elijah. You just need to listen to my son. That's what, more or less what God was telling Peter and Andrew, Peter, Peter, James, and John that day. Just listen to my son. There's a lot of competing voices out there today. A lot of things out there to get your attention, uh, to get you thinking about this and that and the other. A lot of voices, a lot of outlets, a lot of inlets coming into your brain, your mind, and your ears today. The only voice you really need to listen to is that of Jesus. He's the one who speaks to your heart. He's the one who speaks to your deepest needs, your deepest longing. He is the one who speaks to your greatest issues in life. He speaks to your sin. Yes, I know he does. But Jesus can deal with your sin. Other people can only point it out. Have you ever thought about it? You ever, you ever noticed that? Some people are quick to point out your sin. They're quick to point it out, but they can't do anything about it. They'll tell you to do better, be better, be smarter. Don't be so dumb. Don't do those stupid things. They can't do anything about your sin. Oh, but Jesus can point out your sin and do something about it. He can. He can call you out of it. He can change your desires. He can change your heart. He can change your way of thinking about sin. We look at Jesus here as Paul goes on to say, I want to back up to verse 26. Brothers and sisters, children of Abraham's race, and those among you who fear God, meaning the Gentiles who were in that synagogue that day, it is to us that the word of this salvation has been sent. Since the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize him or the sayings of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled their words by condemning him. You see, in this synagogue that that Paul was at, Paul and Barnabas were at, and in every synagogue in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, every synagogue, the prophecies of the Messiah were read every Sabbath. Some were, not every one of them, but some were read every Sabbath because they were looking for him to come. What they did not understand was that when Jesus came, he was fulfilling them. But they also would also read the same prophecies that the Messiah would suffer and be condemned by his own people. They missed that. They completely ignored that. For we find in Jerusalem, we find Jesus riding into the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. And all the people shouting out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We had a great day happening. Whoa, praise. He's come to deliver us. What a great day. Throwing the palm leaves down there and all that stuff happening. Great day. People are crying out. All this praise and the Pharisees go, don't you know what they're saying? 
Don't you know what they're saying? Jesus says, yeah, I know what they're saying. If they don't say it, the wrongs are going to declare it. A few short days later, instead of saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they're shouting, away with him. Crucify him. Let his blood be upon us. And it was upon them. It was. They got exactly what they wanted. Persecution. Death. Turmoil. For a few short years later, Rome burned Jerusalem to the ground, destroyed the temple, and carted off the majority of the Jewish population into captivity. Away from their land. Why? Because they rejected their Messiah. Crucified him. Turned him over to the Romans and had him crucified because they didn't like what he was saying. He wasn't their Messiah or wasn't their, what they were looking for, the Messiah. Wasn't what they were looking for. The resurrection is essential because it fulfills Scripture, because it sets Jesus apart. Jesus appeared in living form to those who had seen him die. Do you believe, do you believe this? Do you believe that those two men on the road to Emmaus, leaving Jerusalem, that Jesus appeared to them? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene and called her name Mary when she thought he was the gardener? Do you believe that he appeared to her? Do you believe that he appeared in the upper room when he had communion, the last supper of the disciples, and showed him his hands and feet? Do you believe that? Do you believe a few days later when Thomas was there, Thomas, come touch my hands and put your hand in my side? Do you believe that? If you do believe that, then guess what? You believe the truth. If you're just holding out for something better, then you're not. You haven't believed the truth. Because there's nothing better than believing in the resurrection. Why do, you, why do people ever want to believe in somebody who's dead that can help them? Why? I, I've told you this story. When we were in China and we were taken to this Buddhist temple. And I've never really, I still don't get a good answer why there's so many Buddhists. Why there's so many? I guess it kind of, when I, the only way I can kind of break it down to my understanding is kind of like the Greek gods, the Assyrian gods, the Canaanite gods, they had a god for everything. The Egyptian gods had a god, I guess they got a Buddha for everything. A Buddha for depression, a, a Buddha for anxiety, a, a Buddha for uh, financial troubles, a Buddha for health, I don't, you know, whatever. I saw these people in there. They're offering their incense and they're praying to these statues of these Buddhas. The whole time I'm in there, I know there's not one prayer being heard except mine. Mine. And I wasn't praying to Buddha either. I wasn't praying to some dead God, some dead human. I was praying to the living God who rose from the dead. Praying for God to draw these people out of this paganism. Draw them out of this. We're praying for you today if you're lost to be saved. We're not praying to some dead person to save you. We're praying to the living God to save you today. The resurrection is essential to fill Scripture, and it sets Jesus apart. And lastly, it does bring salvation and forgiveness. I mentioned these guys earlier, but for, for, for time's sake, uh, David, Solomon, Hezekiah, Josiah, and even King Saul, they brought good things to, to Israel. They brought things, and they did good things to Israel. Even David, when all Saul did to him, after all Saul tried to kill him, run him out of the town, run him, all these, all these bad things Saul did to him, when David found out that Saul was dead, and Jonathan, his son, was dead, who was like a, David's best friend, David sung a song about those two men. And in that... He pointed out even the good things that King Saul had done. And King Saul had done good things. All these other kings I mentioned, they had done good things for the people of Israel. They had. But none of those kings could save their people completely. Saul beat back all the, the, the enemies around Israel for a time. Then here come the Philistines back and they regrouped and attacked him again. He was defeated and died in battle. David 
rose up as king, defeated the Philistines and all of Israel's enemies. Then Solomon became king. No one stood against Solomon until the latter part of his life. Hezekiah, 185,000 Syrian army died out front of his gates one night. Why? Because Hezekiah prayed for deliverance. But he couldn't ultimately deliver his people. He couldn't do it. Josiah led one of the greatest revivals you'll ever see. But it wasn't long term because he couldn't deliver his people completely. Only one king can deliver completely, and that's Jesus. It's him. He's the only one who can bring fulfilling salvation, complete salvation, and ultimate salvation. He is the only one who can eternally save somebody. He is the only one who can eternally forgive somebody of their sins. None of these kings could bring forgiveness for their people. Remember when David sinned by making the census? He wanted to know how many fighting men he had. So he sent Joab out to all the country. Count my troops. I want to know how many I've got. And he did. Joab did, reluctantly did. I think he didn't count the Benjamin. He didn't count the Levites or the Benjamin or somebody. He left one tribe out because he hated it. He hated the job so bad. When David got the word of how many troops he had, as soon as the number was given, David was convicted of his sins. He was convicted of being so proud and arrogant and listening to Satan instead of God. Well, David was given three options of judgment. A plague upon the land, run from your enemies, and another one, a pestilence or whatever it was upon the land. David says, I don't know what to do. I don't want to fall into man's hands. Uh, let me fall into the hands of God. And, and a great plague broke out upon the land of Judah, upon Israel. Suddenly, though, David realized what had happened and asked God to forgive him. He says, God, why are you destroying these sheep? It's me that sin, not them. David stood up and took responsibility for his actions, but he could not ultimately save his people. For the mountain that David went when he saw the angel of death coming upon Jerusalem, God stayed at the angel's hands. David went up there, the threshing floor, threshing floor of Urin, I believe his name, he bought that, that threshing floor. If you go back in the Old Testament, the exact same place that Abraham tied Isaac up and laid him on an altar. The exact same place that later a temple would be built where sacrifices would be made, where Jesus would come in and run the money changers out, and drive them away. Same place. They can only temporarily save their people, those kings came. Kings could. But Jesus, by dying on the cross, rising from the dead, he brought eternal deliverance for his people, for anyone who will believe. Notice what Paul says in verse 42. As they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism, those are Gentiles now, followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. Jesus' death and resurrection brought both, listen here, forgiveness and salvation. Brought both. Not just one, brought both. New life is given to all who believe in Jesus as being God in human flesh, dying on the cross, rising from the dead. That's what happens. When the Gentiles heard this in verse 48, and we'll cover, cover this next Sunday, Lord's help, and maybe in a week or two, and we don't see how God, how God does it. But when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. In that moment in time, God was drawing out Jews and Gentiles alike to be saved. He was revealing to them the Old Testament scriptures, and he did those two guys on the road to Emmaus. Oh, didn't our hearts burn when he spoke to us? Why? Yeah, your hearts burned because that was God speaking to you. Let me, let me remind you, for those of us who've been saved for a very long time, do you remember when God spoke to you when you were lost? Do you remember that feeling that came over you, that desperation in your life? I need to be saved. Do you remember when that desperation vanished away? When you knew you were right with God and God was your Savior. God was your one who loved you so much. Do you remember that night, that day, whatever it was? 
the transformation that came upon you? When's the last time God spoke to you? Or may, let me have a better rephrase the question. When's the last time you heard God speak to you? That still small voice. I heard him this morning. I heard him sitting on that front pew a few moments ago, too. He spoke to me. Well, I didn't hear anything, Paul. And no, I, you didn't hear what I heard. <laughs> he spoke to me. And I didn't hear it in my ears. I heard it in my heart. I heard it in the real me, the one you don't see on the inside. <laughs> because sometimes this one here is a fake. This one here sometimes puts a smile on his face. Like that song they sung and said, I'm good. <laughs> you don't see the real me sometimes. I told Brett the real me this morning, though. You can ask him about him later. Sometimes the real, sometimes the real me ain't good. You don't like, you won't like him. You may not like this me either, you know. But God still speaks to us. Why? Because he's alive. He died rose again, and he's still speaking to those who will believe in his son today. That's what he did here in the synagogue. He spoke to these people through the scriptures and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, his son, and he drew people to salvation when they heard the word of God. How are they going to hear unless we tell them? How are people going to be saved unless we tell them about Jesus? That's why I ask you way back in the start of this thing. When's the last time Jesus came up in your conversations with somebody? When's the last time he came up in conversation? It's, the, it's, it's essential. The resurrection is essential. The scriptures are essential. I think you know where we're going maybe next Sunday. <laughs> There's a few other things essential. At least one major thing's essential. And we'll have one in a moment. Folks, God is still drawing people to salvation. We've got to invite them to come. Invite them to believe. Invite them to hear the truth. Invite them. If they say yes and they accept the invitation, then praise be the living God. If they say no, we've done our part. Let God do the rest. Invite them again. Keep inviting them until they say no, 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 yes. Keep inviting them until they go away and you never see them again. If they do that, then... God forbid they do that, right? If they do, they do. We keep working. We keep pressing on. Because we want that one person to be saved. That next person to be saved. And I believe they're here today. I don't believe God gives me a message about the resurrection by chance. I don't, give, I don't believe he gives me a, res, a message about salvation by chance on a whim. No, I don't. I believe God knows exactly who's here today. I know he knows exactly everybody's heart is here today. He knew everybody in the synagogue that day, Paul and Barnabas spoke. He knew every one of them. He knew the Jews who were there and the Gentiles who were there. And those who God spoke to who would believe, he drew them to salvation. Will you just believe today that Jesus is God's son, that he came and died for your sins, your sins and mine, and that he rose from the dead three days later. He's alive today, he's in heaven, and he's going to come back. That's it. That's all you got to do. Believe that. Ask him to save you and forgive you of your sins, and he will do it. He will do it. Because of the resurrection. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you're living today. You're not dead. Thank you, God, that you're going to send Jesus Christ back someday and take those of us who have been born again home to be with you forever. Where there'll be no more death, no sicknesses, no problems, no depression, no pain, no suffering. Those things will all be gone. Replaced with simply just love, joy, peace. Today, Father, we can experience your peace today. We can experience your love today and your joy 
if we would just simply trust your son Jesus Christ as our Savior. God, I pray for that one or that others that are here lost today. God, may you speak to them. Convict them of their sins and draw them to you today. God, you're amazing and good. And we commit this time to you. We commit these people to you. And bless each one who's here. In Christ's name we pray. And amen.